this is Cooper, not Curtis, in case anybody was confused. Cooper, did a good job. Our youth are going to be leading us in worship today. This is uh, Youth Sunday. I don't know if this is a nationally recognized holiday, but uh, it's something official here at the church that we do. And so we're taking time to recognize our graduating seniors today. They're going to receive a Bible from us today, except for Casey Hare, who graduated from college, and he already was supposed to have a Bible. So, uh, But Casey did graduate from college yesterday, too. Huh? Did, we sure about that? He reads it? Okay, good. He reads it. That's good. All right. Well, at this time, I'm going to recognize Josh, and he's going to come, and he's going to read our scripture. And we are substituting our deacon of the week this week for one of our youth. And Josh is coming. This is not Porky. This is Josh. So Josh, you come. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Uh, we have one announcement today, and that's to sign up for VBS if you're willing to volunteer. Uh, the sign-up's out on the bulletin. Um, I just want to remind you all of one thing. And that's uh, the reason that we are here is to lift up Jesus. Uh, so we're going to do that throughout the service in many different ways. Um, the verse of this week for Deacon of the Week, Porky was kind enough to let me do it, is 1 Timothy 4.12. And that verse says, Let no man despise thy youth, be thou, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and in purity. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today just thanking you for another day of life. God, thank you for allowing us to gather in your house once again. Um, thank you for allowing us all to make it safely, even with the weather, God. Please help us to just now clear our minds and allow us to focus on you. God, please help us to not forget the reason that we're here, and that's to lift up your name, God. Please help us to take with, what, take with us uh, what we learned today. Just please help it to um, change our lives and allow us to take it out and share it with the world. Um, please be with us now. Um, just allow the youth to minister to you, God, and thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we've got our youth that we're recognizing today, and we've also got a Martha Baldwin spotting back there in the back. Y'all be sure and uh, tell Martha you're glad to see her here this morning, and we're very grateful to have you out and about this morning, Miss Martha. If you all would, uh, just be praying for Paige. Paige is going to come at this time, and she's going to share testimonies. Paige, you come. Oh, okay. Well, I'm already messing this up. Dylan's going to come and do birthdays and anniversaries first, and then Paige is going to come. Sorry, Paige. Dylan, you come, brother. Paige, by the way, so Dylan came and talked to me Easter Sunday? Yes. Easter Sunday, and uh, wants to be a member here at our church, and so we, uh, Dylan... Is going to be, I guess, Wednesday night. We'll actually officially vote him in at the business meeting. But Dylan came and made public to me and wants to make, you know, let our church know he wants to be a member here at the church. So, Dylan, thank you. Thank you. All righty. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries we're celebrating this week? So if you don't know me, my name is Paige. I'm going to try to keep this short. I would like to share a little bit of my testimony before we really get started here. Um, if you're lucky, you didn't know me in middle school because that was my rough patch. I was in a really dark place. I kind of was ashamed of who I was as a Christian, and that really 
took me away from church and God, and I'm, I'm ashamed of that now instead of being a Christian. Um, it was, like I said, it was really dark. I was all anti-Christian. I was trying to find excuses not to be a Christian, trying to convince myself that I didn't believe and stuff like that. But then in 2018, my oldest brother, Clark, died in a car accident, and I was just so angry at God, and I was like, why did this happen? What made, like, why would you do this? And then that really made me realize, like, I'm angry at a God that I'm telling myself I don't believe in. And that really got me thinking about it, so I started praying about it, and I finally, that I think was the turning point in uh, my walk with Jesus, because that got me back into church, and that got me studying my Bible again, and now I'm here, and I would, I wouldn't change it for the world, because I'm in a much better place now than I've ever been in my entire life, and I only have God to thank for that, so that's, I sure as I'm going to keep it, because I don't want to, my mom's already crying, so I don't want to (laughs) cry, so thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's worship, and I'm so glad to see everyone here today. Paige is one of my favorite people, and a week ago, I saw her at the Alcoa Walmart, and I, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm grocery shopping, and she had a tub of Cheetos. That was it. <laughs> that was great, <laughs> grocery shopping. <laughs> All right, at this time, Cooper is going to lead us in the choir. Cooper and the Youth Choir, we got to think of like a really cool name other than Cooper and the Youth Choir. Paige, work on that, will you? We're going to come up with a really good name. Cooper? Cooper and the Jets. Cooper and the Jets. All right, Cooper and the Jets are going to come and lead us in worship at this time. Cooper. All right, would you all turn to your Baptist hymnal to page 475, Victory in Jesus. And may you all please stand.
would you all stay in your Baptist hymnal and please turn to page 462, Love Lifted Me. All may be seated. Hello, hi. So we are uh, the youth leaders. I'm Beth. My name's Janine Greg. You guys know us. We just want to speak for a minute and tell you about what we see our youth doing, how we see our youth growing. This is an amazing, amazing group of kids. They're really wonderful. <laughs> we have grown so very close to these kids, and they have grown and are growing close to each other. I want to read a couple of verses. It's Ecclesiastes 3, 12 and 13. I know, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift of God. So, Jenny told us yesterday <laughs> that we needed to speak today. Um, I always just want to have fun with these kids. Um, we have fun with these kids. Everything we do, we plan around fun, but through them having a good time, through ourselves having a good time, we see these kids growing stronger in God and closer to God. Um, just recently, we have things going on 
it seems like every day of my life we're doing something with the year. But just recently, we um, had, well, there was Good Good Friday, and I know that um, some of our youth attended Good Good Friday. And after that, we had what we call Big Wednesday. It happens downstairs. Several of you were there. Um, it's just an amped up version of what we do every Wednesday with some special music, with a special guest speaker. And it was wonderful. It was our very first go at it, and it was wonderful. We had a, a good turnout. We had super fun. And there was one youth in particular that I'm thinking of right now, and the message that we heard on Wednesday, the things that we did, the things that we experienced, the ball, the ball had been rolling, I guess. Wednesday night helped keep that ball rolling. Uh, fast forward only two days later, we didn't have a large event planned. Uh, it was our, our lock-in downstairs, which again, is fun, 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 just so much fun. And during the evening, come to find out towards um, around, I guess midnight was about the first time that it was, something was said to me, but we took the kids bowling and at the bowling alley, uh, there was a special prayer that had taken place in the restroom. Um, we had another couple uh, youth who witnessed to another youth um, just willy-nilly outside of the snack area. Um, and later that evening, at a youth lock-in, when all we had planned was fun, 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 a youth came to Jesus with a young lady that was, that was saved at our lock-in. And the point of wait, all of wait. Oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> so look, church, we're gonna have a better reaction than that. <laughs> One of our youth got saved Friday night at Fango. Thank you. <laughs> and and so I guess part of what I'm getting at is we have fun doing what we do. But these guys behind us, these guys and girls behind us are growing. They're our future, they're your future. And they love Jesus, and they're sharing that with each other and with others. So it is our job to help these kids grow more, grow bigger, grow better. And that's my part. <coughs> so we just wanted to share with you guys, some of you know some of the stuff that we have done with the kids, uh, the opportunity that we've had that you guys have actually been a big, very big part of. You all have supported us. Am I not close enough nope. to the mic? Okay. Nope. <laughs> you have supported us um, and Everybody enabled the activities to happen. So um, I looked at our calendar and I actually was amazed at the stuff that we've, we've been able to accomplish. Um, it started with the early bird special breakfast with the Golden Agers. That was an awesome opportunity for our kids to um, start building a relationship with some of our more seasoned adults in the church. Um, we had our winter retreat this year that was fantastic. We had a guest speaker that really connected with the kids. Um, I can say that, did you all enjoy the winter retreat this year? Yeah. yeah. So, that was a big Wednesday. What's that? <laughs> yes, and that was our same speaker that we used for our big Wednesday. It was, it was Thomas, and he did a fantastic job talking into the lives of these kids. And to hear their feedback coming from that retreat, they heard what he said. You know, and they were starting to apply what, what he said. Um, we also started doing this really fun thing called a pickup basketball game at Camp Tipton. And we've had the opportunity to do it twice so far. And we just have a random Friday game, and we invite other churches to come play basketball with us. And it's been great. Uh, we've had devotions led by youth leaders from other churches. Um, it's that If you get an opportunity, you hear about that, come out and watch them play. It's a lot of fun. Um, we did our Sweetheart Spaghetti Fellowship, a middle-aged mixer, which was fantastic. Uh, we, one of the highlights for me for the middle-aged mixer was one of the activities we gave them was to be in a group with adults and children, but we asked them just random questions, and one of them was to share their salvation story, and the four of us just kind of sat back and listened to the groups that were interacting, and our kids were sharing their testimony without even realizing they were sharing their testimony. You know, that's very intimidating for most of them to do. But they just were able to open up to our middle-agers and be able to share their salvation story and then hear that reciprocated from the adults. And it was just fantastic. That has helped them and encouraged them more than you guys can imagine. Um, we had our youth bake sale. You guys came out. We raised lots of money for that. 
so that we're able to do some of these activities with these kids. Um, we did Camp Tip Tipton Serve Day. We, we went over and we spent uh, an afternoon, or well, bulk of the day, um, power washing and I don't know if you want to call that weed whacking. Was that weed whacking? Yeah. Weed whacking trails back there. Um, we just serving together. That's one of the things we're working on teaching them is to serve. Um, and giving them opportunities to do that inside our community, inside our church. Um, Easter caroling spurred from our Christmas caroling. We went Christmas caroling this year, and that was fantastic. These kids were touched when they went into the homes of our stick and shut in and were able to just encourage them. And to see the, what would you say was the most, uh, the best thing you can remember from doing it was the reaction of, people crying it touched them <laughs> and we're standing in their homes praying with them and it really moved these kids we, didn't get, we did not go to make them cry though no we didn't make them cry our singing did not make them cry but they, they were they touched have, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but that spurred when we were out christmas caroling they said hey let's do this for easter so we did it for easter and it was well received it was fantastic these kids did a super job next year i hope you guys join us for the christmas caroling i mean it's not just for us we're just trying to initiate it for everybody to do it with us um, volunteering, that was another, they're serving at these functions that we, with the OA 21, the Smoky Mountain Revival, the kids are excited about serving, they're excited about getting into the community and representing Mount Colony, and representing God most, in, first and foremost. Um, Big Wednesday, that is, we did our first one this past Wednesday, and it was fantastic. Um, Kelly came out, well, Kelly came out, uh, Curtis came out, they helped support us, they, they formed a praise team, and they, we had amazing worship. Would you say that? Amen. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, we had our lock-in. This, <laughs> this past lock-in was great. It's been a busy week. We had Big Wednesday lock-ins and then today. But um, our lock-in, we weren't sure. We, you know, we've been promoting the kids. Whoever brings the most gifts gets the pie, one of the youth leaders in the face with a pie of their choice. Um, so we were hoping that would help them bring guests. Well, we ended up with 34 kids. It was crazy. It was a fun, fun night. Um, the fact that we witnessed, unprovoked from us, two of our youth sitting at a table sharing God's word with uh, another youth who was struggling was just amazing to me. You know, we had nothing to do with that. And then to hear that they're in the bathroom praying to, with her who was hurting, that just blew me away. And then later that evening, her giving her life to the Lord. So it's just what you guys are supporting is worth it. Um, we have lots of fun activities. We feed these kids lots of food. <laughs> lots of food. Lisa is our trooper. This is one of our moms, and she's there every week helping us feed these kids. Okay? Um, if you ever want to come out and help feed the kids every Wednesday night, uh, we're here. But... That brings them in early. We've adjusted their time frame so that they're here early. They want to be here early. I, we can even say to them, hey, 6 o'clock, they're going to be here. Especially if we have food. But they'll be here. Um, and then we have summer camp. We did it last year. It was our first year doing it. This year we're going again. We're going to rough it because it's a rough camp. But it's good because these kids are together 24-7 and they're growing. And it's awesome. So pray for our camp coming up. We have it coming up in June. Pray for our leaders because we're going to rough it again. <laughs> and uh, but we just want to thank you guys. We want you to be aware of what's happening. We want you to see that you know your support is is causing growth to occur and growth in the Lord, and that's the most significant thing that I can say. So thank you. Well. Thank you again. We do. We appreciate all the support we get from you all. I mean, if it wasn't for the church, you know, none of this would be possible. So we just really appreciate everything that you all do for us, too. Uh, but we do, you know, I like to say, just like Beth, I love to have fun. <clears throat> and uh, whenever we all got together, we started talking about doing the kickball last year. When we did that, it really boosted. And I felt like it, it sort of brought everybody together a little bit and got the youth more involved and they talked to us and told us how much they enjoyed it and you know we wanted to do more stuff like that to get the kids involved to get the adults involved and so that's why we've been trying to sort of bring all this together because I know how it was as a youth you know you didn't really want to talk to the older 
people. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they were way more knowledge. And back then, I used to always think, oh, man, you know, they bore me. But now that I guess I'm getting older, unfortunately, I listen to my kids talk to me at home sometimes and they bore me. <laughs> but, but, but we love to have fun. We love to have fun and we love to try to get the kids all pumped up and everything. And I've got a verse, too, that I was wanting to share. It's in a, it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. And it says, therefore, encourage one another, build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. And we tried to get the kids to get involved with that. And, you know, even me, I have to work on it, too, still. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not always great at it, but I try to share and I try to, you know, encourage others because, you know, we need, we need that pat on the back sometimes. We try to tell the kids even if they see a kid that they don't know at school, you know, you don't know what they're going through. I don't know what people are going through that I work with every day. And, you know, people are private. You know, I'm, I'm a private person, too. I understand it. And, uh, but, you know, when you see somebody down, you can tell they're having a rough day. You know, we try to tell them, you know, hey, just give them a pat on the back. Tell them you'll pray for them. You know, sometimes it's just that little spark right there that somebody needs that, you know, especially like, you know, Paige, my, ne my niece, Sharon, you know, that she struggled back in middle school. And, and I remember when she went through her little dark time because I, I worried for her because <laughs> I was like, man, man, Paige worries me a little bit. I don't know where, she, where her mind is, you know, but, but I know she's got great parents and I knew that they would, uh, they'd bring her back in. And, uh, but she, uh, you know, when you see kids like that, though, and you have somebody that shares with them, just, you know, just even the little pat on the back, tell them to pray for them, you know, sometimes that's all they need because they're searching, they're searching for something in their life that, you know, nobody else has given them, and sometimes it's just that one person, that one little thing that you can do that'll, that brings them back to God, so, but I am, I'm very thankful for this youth group, and you know, they're good about bringing friends. If you come on Wednesday nights, like they said, and like on the lock-in, you know, we tell them. We do encourage them to bring friends because we want them to reach out to others that that need the Lord. And they've done a good job on that, and I'm very proud of them. I'll keep my part brief. Just, I just want to say I'm so proud of these youth leaders behind me as well. I'm thankful for their, for their service and their love for the, the youth that's behind them. And I also love these youth that's sitting behind them as well. Um, I want to share with you a verse, and we'll close, close our part with this. And we'll, it, it, don't blame Scott for being late today, by the way. <laughs> but uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men that shall be able to teach others also. And in that verse, it's one of my life verses. It reminds me that, that I'm, I've been called by God to share what, what somebody else has shared with me, and that's the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's really the heart of our youth ministry, and I think all these behind me will agree. We, we want to not only share what, what we've been taught, but we want to share the gospel and help them to be encouraged to share the gospel with other people as well. And I'm so very proud. Lately, they've already testified to what happened this past week. I'm so very proud of our youth that are already getting excited about sharing their faith with other people and communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around them. So just keep praying for us as we continue to labor for the Lord and as the youth continue to grow in the Lord. Thank God for each one of you all. Let's pray together. And that right does what youth have a song they want to share with you all. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together and this youth Sunday. We thank you, Lord, that we can just be able to share uh, a little bit of what God, you've been doing in, in and through our youth ministry this year. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you're going to do as we continue to labor for you. Pray that you help us to be faithful, God. Help us to be uh, diligent to, to present the gospel to all that will come and hear it. And, Lord, help us to be faithful in our, in our, in our church family, Lord, just to go out into the world this week and share, God, share Jesus with those that will hear it as well. God, I ask now that you just be glorified in the rest of our service, be, be exalted in all that we say and do. Bless, bless our time together now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you steal a microphone? <laughs> Avery's done swiped a microphone. All right. I think I'm think I'm ready to go, Herc. If you would turn with me to the book of Daniel, and I want to talk to all of us, uh, particularly our young folks today. I uh, want to talk to you today about true faith and trying times. And talk to you a little bit about what the Bible has to say about how to stand for your faith when others try to tear it down. Daniel tells us a little bit about that. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Now, uh, let me just catch you up in case you don't know. The Bible is not just one book. It is a collection of books. There's a whole bunch of books in the Bible. It's divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament makes up about two-thirds of the Bible. The New Testament makes up about a third of the Bible. I'm rounding off. Daniel is a book found in the Old Testament. He is one of the prophets, one of the major prophets. And so if you'll go to um, about the middle of your Bible, you'll find you'll probably turn about the middle of your Bible to Psalms. And so if you'll go to your right, go toward the back of the book from Psalms, you'll find Daniel. So the, Daniel um, is, about half of the book of Daniel is narrative, telling the story, and the other half of the book of, the, of Daniel is prophecy. We're going to deal with one of the stories today found in Daniel chapter 1 with Daniel and his friends as they are young teenagers. Verse 3 of Daniel chapter 1 says this, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among those were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hannah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the chance to be here. We thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you, to be able to know you and to follow you. Father, help us today to do that. Help us to be more like Jesus, less like the old person we used to be. If somebody here is lost, I pray that today would be the day they come to know you as Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray that you would help us to live for Jesus Christ our whole life through until we see him face to face. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Some of you have seen movies like this. When I was a kid, a movie came out and then it was called King Kong 3D. Steve, do you own that movie? It's probably the only movie you don't own, I think. King Kong 3D. Now, the, the, I think it was actually King Kong 3 and then they made it 3D. And so when you went to the movies to see King Kong 3D, they gave you these funny looking glasses and one side was red and the other side, you know, one lens was red and the other side was blue, I think, maybe green. I can't even remember at this point. Doesn't much matter. I think it was red and blue. You put these funny looking glasses on and then it looks like King Kong was literally jumping off the screen right at you. Looked like you've been eaten by a giant gorilla. Uh, so Roger was at the zoo this week, I think, weren't you, Roger? You, didn't, no danger of being eaten by a gorilla. Okay, good. Uh, they, they let you loose. All right, good. Well, we're glad to have you with us this morning. <clears throat> King Kong 3D, however, if you didn't wear the glasses, you didn't wear the special lenses that made everything jump off the screen at you, you just kind of looked blurry and unclear. Wasn't a very good movie without the glasses on. I'm not sure it was a masterpiece with the glasses, but it wasn't a very good movie without them at all. You couldn't understand anything that was going on. Everything was, was just blurry. And um, you and I, and especially you young folks, 
We live in a world where everything is blurry, where there's no clear lines, no clear definitions. Everybody seems to want to tear down everything that you and I have valued for a long time. And so the ideas that you and I may behold to and some of you grew up with, those ideas are being torn down daily and torn apart. Everything is blurry. Nothing is clear. And you and I need some 3D glasses to help us to see. Now, the lens that we look through is not some special glasses that you get at the movie theater. It isn't the colors red and blue which help you to see. What we find is, as we look at life through the biblical lens, through what the Bible has to say about life, you and I are able to see things much more clearly than we can without the Word of God. There are biblical principles which will help you try to have true faith in trying times. How do you navigate this world that we live in anymore? Well, the only answer I have to give you, and young folks, the only answer I have to give you today, the truth is the only answer there really needs to be, is you take what the Bible says and you live by that. So Daniel gives us some of those principles in this first chapter and helps us to understand how we can live this life in a, in a blurry world, how we can have a clear vision for how we're supposed to live. And here's my, my first biblical principle to you is this. Know what defines you. What defines you? What's the stuff that you're made of? What's significant about your life? Daniel, you see, in the, by the way, let me catch you up to where we're at. Babylon came into Judah. There was um, Israel. And then eventually Israel broke into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was still called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. Israel was conquered in 722 by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, Judah, was conquered much later in 586, 587 B.C., by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. That's what we're talking about here. This is during that time when Judah was conquered by Babylon. And we read, verse 3 starts off by saying that, that they took among them, when they conquered Judah, what Babylon did is they took some of the princes and some of the kings, they took the best, the brightest, the smartest, the fastest, the strongest, the ones who would be uh, the, the leaders of that country, Though whenever they would, were older, they took those youths and they took them into a foreign country, the country of Babylon, and they changed everything about them. Verse 4 says this, Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability uh, to, in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might reach the, teach the learning and the tongues of the Chaldeans. Verse 7 says this, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. And then he tells the names that he gave to Daniel, Hananiah, Zechariah, and Mishael. Nazariah and Mishael. Now, throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel is still called Daniel. He doesn't go by Belteshazzar very often. He usually uses the name Daniel. He's the one that wrote the book, so I guess that's why. He just went by his given name. But you'll see uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, you'll see them referred to pretty consistently through the book as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's probably the names you know them by, although that wasn't their original name. What defines you? Daniel and his companions, his compatriots, his friends had to change their clothes. They had to change where they lived. They had to change the language that they spoke. They changed, apparently, their education system to some degree. They even changed their name. And Daniel and his friends were willing to go along with all those things and to do those things. Now, why were they willing to accept those sorts of changes and to do so without objection? Well, one of the reasons they did so is because Daniel and his friends knew what defined them. Let me tell you something. Uh, if you're a preacher, let's say, and you wear a suit every Sunday, which I generally do, and I probably always will. I don't know if I always will. Never say never, but I probably always will. 
most people here on Sunday mornings don't wear suits. I don't do it because everybody here dresses like that or I think it's going to be. I do it because I want people to know that I take my job seriously. And that's really, I, I take God seriously and I take our, my church seriously and I want to do a good job. And so I want to dress and reflect that. And it's just sort of a personal conviction of mine. But I'm going to tell you something. You can wear a suit every Sunday, and that does not make you holy. You know, it doesn't make you righteous. And I'm going to tell you something else. If you're here today and you're wearing blue jeans, that doesn't make you unrighteous either, does it? The clothes you wear don't define who you are. The language you speak doesn't define who you are. Some people speak with a prim and proper accent. Some people even have a British accent and sound a lot smarter than everybody else in the world if you have a British accent. Some people sound like me and they sound like a hillbilly and it doesn't make you sound that smart except for to people like Scott Moses. I think he appreciates that. Nobody else much does. I think Scott's guarding the door for us today by the way. Some people, some people sound like they're from New Hampshire and in Rhode Island and and let's see, yeah, I know he always gets to throw something at me whenever I say Rhode Island. Some people sound like they're from New Hampshire, and uh, I can't understand anything they say. Some people sound like they're from Maryland, and I don't understand anything those people in Maryland say for sure. Uh, I, I like being from the South, and I don't mind having a Southern accent. Doesn't make me, doesn't bother me. But I'm going to tell you something, it doesn't make me better than anybody else because I have a southern accent. It doesn't define who I am as a person. What if I, God called me to be a missionary in Canada and, I, and nobody could understand my southern accent and I had to try to change that? Would, uh, would that make me less of a person? I don't think so because I don't think that I'm defined by my accent. Doesn't that make me a good person or a bad person? Doesn't make me right with the Lord or wrong with the Lord because I have a fairly thick southern accent. What you wear, what you sound like, those things, those things don't define us because the Bible doesn't say that they define us that way. The Bible doesn't define us that way. The Bible says that if you're born, then you are made in the image of God. Now that's part of the de definition of who we are is that if you're a person, if you're alive today, you are made in the image of God. Now that ought to tell you something about what you ought to be doing with your life. If you're made in the image of God, you ought to be living for Him. Now, that's a whole other sermon, and I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. But the Bible does tell us some things that define us. But what you wear and the kind of school you went to and the, the language that you speak, those things don't define you. They even changed their name. And they were okay with changing their name because their name didn't define them. Now, I haven't, uh, I haven't ever changed my name. But I do go by Scott. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but my name is Scott. It's the name I, people refer to me as. That's my middle name, Scott. My name is actually Stephen Scott. And anytime I get any official mail or I have to sign an official document, I have to sign it as Stephen. And Stephen is a terrible, terrible name. Nobody should be named Stephen. Well, except for my dad. But other than that, other than that, People will call me sometimes Stephen if they don't know me, you know, if it's somebody that reads a name off a list. My teachers, when I was in school, if they didn't know who I was, they would say Stephen Lingenfelter. It didn't take them long to figure it out. They would call me Scott, but they would call me Stephen on the first day of school. But Stephen, I, Steve Petronelli is a Stephen also. I've been, from Rhode Island. I've insulted you twice today, Steve. We, <laughs> Connecticut, yeah, that's right. That's easier to remember, isn't it? Connecticut. When people call me Stephen instead of Scott, do you think that all of a sudden changed who I was? I've been called Stephen. I've been called Scott. I've been called a lot worse things than that. <laughs> Sometimes by my own family, maybe even today. I've been called a lot worse than Stephen and Scott. But those things don't define who I am. Don't change who I am. Somebody calls me by the wrong name calls me Roberto or something like that, wouldn't change who I am, doesn't change what defines me. I have to find what defines me. And how do I do that? Young people, how do you find what makes you who you are? Through 
what's popular today, whatever music that you listen to, whatever your friends are doing, whatever uh, the the whatever social media tells you you're supposed to be, is that how you're going to define yourself? Or are you going to define something else, something better, something greater that makes you who you are? Well, while we're talking about who you are and how you how you define yourself, the Bible tells us know what defines you, and the Bible also says to know what defiles you. What defiles you? So they changed their name, their language, their clothes, even changed, they changed everything about themselves, their location, but there was one thing that they wouldn't change. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So you need to know what defines you. You also need to know what defiles you. What does the Bible say is off limits? Where are the lines? Where are the limits? They change their clothes, change their language, change their name, but they wouldn't eat the king's meat. Now, is it sinful to eat meat? Oh, I hope not. If it's sinful to eat meat, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> I'm not going to make it into heaven if it's sinful to eat meat. I'm sure not going to make it through the rest of this day even if it's sinful to eat meat. I hope it's not sinful to eat meat. The Bible doesn't give that indication anywhere. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, the Bible specifically told Noah, God specifically told Noah, go out and eat meat. The Bible never said it's sinful to eat meat. So why does Daniel then refuse to eat meat if the Bible doesn't say it's sinful to eat meat? I'm going to tell you why. It's because this meat was not prepared in a kosher fashion. Y'all know that word kosher? You ever heard that word kosher? You, you, you've heard, all right, I'll give you an example. You all know those Hebrew national hot dogs, right? And they have a commercial, kind of a motto that they use that goes along with Hebrew national hot dogs. Y'all know what the motto is? No ifs, ands, or nobody's, they don't know he's going to say but in church, right? No ifs, ands, or buts. That's their motto. It's not ifs, ands, or buts, B U T. It's ifs, ands, or buts, B U T T. And that second T makes a pretty big difference in the understanding of that word there. It means the hind end of a cow. Now, why do they say no ifs, ands, or buts? Because for something to be kosher, it had to be from the front end part of the cow. Under the law of Moses, God told them what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. And he even told them what parts of an animal they could eat. So in order to eat meat, it had to come from ruminant animals with cloven hooves. That would be things like uh, cows, sheep, goats, lambs, deer. Not pigs. They don't chew the cud. They're a little different kind of an animal. They have slit hooves, but they don't chew cud. They're a little bit different. So you're talking about ruminant animals that chew cud, have a split hoof, and then you have to eat the front part of that animal. Now, why did God tell them that? Because it's sinful to eat, um, you know, is rump roast. Is that a sin to eat a rump roast? Is that, that's not the point God was trying to make. If you get into the New Testament, God told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Animals that in the Old Testament were considered unclean. And then he said, what I have called clean, don't you call unclean. The point of those Old Testament rules was not because eating meat was sinful or eating the hind part of a cow somehow is immoral. The point of that is this, that God is different. Do you know that? God never sins. Do you know that? He's perfect, pure, holy, untouched, undefiled by sin. How about you? Well, you're not perfect. I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not. Neither am I. None of us are perfect, and God is. 
And so God used these visual reminders of the food that they ate and the clothes that they wore. There were certain things that they could and couldn't do. Some things that were in bounds and some things that were out of bounds. Some things that were allowable and some things that would have been a foul. Some things that God says you can do and some things God says you can't do. And some of those things, it's not because the item in itself was immoral, because it was painting a picture for them. God was perfect, and God held the children of Israel to higher standards. I'm going to tell you something. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God wants you to hold yourself to a higher standard. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. As a matter of fact, let me stop right here and tell you this. If you think, if you think, that not eating the hind part of a cow is because you're perfect and that's the picture you're supposed to get, you're completely missing the point. It's not that you're perfect. It's that God is. And you and I need to hold ourselves to a higher standard, the standard that God holds us to, because God is perfect. We're not. As a matter of fact, God knows we're not perfect. So much so that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus left heaven and came to this earth. He was born a special, unique birth, a virgin birth. He lived a special, unique life, a sinless life. And then Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place and in my place for your sins and for my sins. On the third day He rose from the dead. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. One day He is coming back to receive all those unto Himself who believe in Him. That's what God did for you. The things in the Old Testament that were pictured in the New Testament, we see in a person. So what was incomplete in the Old Testament, the rules about what you could eat and what you couldn't, and what parts you could eat and what parts you couldn't, those rules that that were incomplete and imperfect but were a picture of something else, what they were a picture of is Jesus. And the perfection that God has that you and I cannot have, Jesus has it. Jesus lived a sinless life, and then He died on the cross. If you will ask Him to, Jesus will take your sinfulness, and He will give you His righteousness. The world's best, worst trade. So how do you know? How do you know what you can do and what you can't? Well, I'm going to... I may shock you here. Last week, David Hodges said something that had a lot of wisdom in it. (laughs) Last week, David said this. Now, this part won't shock you. He said this, I'm not always right. Can I get an amen? David said, he said, I'm not always right. But he said this, he said, I'm not always right. But nobody else is always right either. And it'd probably do us all a lot of good to remember it. Well, David's not always right. I'm not always right. Neither are you. But God is. He is always right. So here's here's how you know what defiles you. You read what God says. You live by it. It's fairly simple. You just pick up your Bible, read it, trust it, believe it, learn it, study it, and live by it. What God says is always right and always true. And listen, what God doesn't say, you and I need to be very careful about speaking authoritatively about. What God says, stand on it. Young folks, what the Bible says, trust it, live by it, believe it. You may not understand all of God's reasons right now. When somebody at school, somebody at work, a friend of yours starts arguing with you about some of your beliefs, about morality and sinfulness and God and eternity and all those things, you may not understand all of the reasons for what God says, but I can promise you this, what God says is always right and always true. Your friends are going to be proven wrong and God will be proven right. Trust God. Live by what He says, do what God says, and trust Him. He knows what he's talking about. He made it all. (laughs) He's created it all. Everything today that moves and breathes and has a being, God causes that and sustains that. God knows what he's talking about. Stand on his word. 
Now, that means this. You, you and I don't have to be an expert on everything. We don't have to have a, an opinion on everything. Whatever, uh, I, let me say this. The last few weeks, you haven't heard me stand up and preach a sermon about how the government should handle the situation in Ukraine. Now, that's a terrible situation. There are some things that we need to stand on, like, for instance, probably shouldn't try to invade a country and kill people. I think that's probably a pretty good rule to go by. I, I, I'll tell you this, I, I'll preach against communism pretty regularly because communism is a godless ideology that is contrary to the principles of Scripture. Communism is wrong, sinful, and evil, godless. I'll stand against communism every time. But I'm not a foreign policy expert. And I don't have to have an opinion about what should be done in Ukraine. I really don't have an opinion about what. I don't know. That's a terrible, terrible situation, and I don't have an expert opinion about it. God's in control. He can handle Russia and Ukraine, and He'll have to. I cannot. But I can tell you what I, what I know. I know that you and I are lost because of our sin, separated from God, and Jesus died to save you. And I can stand on that. I can proclaim that and live by it. It has changed my entire life, the fact that Jesus loves me and died for me. <laughs> Paige was talking about being angry with God. and Came to the realization that she was angry at a God that she took, wanted to believe didn't exist. That, I, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I, hey, listen, I applaud the, the truthfulness in that testimony, Paige. That's a great testimony. Thank you for sharing it. You know, Paige, what you said, I'm going to tell you something about me. And I can only speak for me, but I think it's true of you and a lot of other people. I can say this. I have not always lived for the Lord and done what is right. But um, I don't really have to be ashamed of that. And you don't either. God loves you just as much as if you had always lived for Him and you never stumbled. All of us have not lived for God at some point. All of us have stumbled. None of us are perfect. Jesus Christ is. Here's the truth of the matter, folks. And you want to know the truth of the matter about being saved? I got saved a long time ago, and I have never regretted it once. But the better truth is this. God has never regretted saving me. And I have failed Him, and I have faltered, and I have let Him down, and He has never regretted saving me one single time. His Son, Jesus Christ, shed His blood for my sins, died so I might be saved, and you might be saved, has promised us a home in heaven, and eternity, and glory, and a future, and forever. And we get to be there, not just me, but all those who know Jesus Christ and who love Him. All of us are promised that anybody can have that. Know what defines you. Know what defiles you. Know who will defend you. The Bible mentions three other names. Hananiah, Zariah, Mishael, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know those names because you've probably heard the story of the fiery furnace at some point in your life. Now, I'll skip the fiery furnace. Let me just skip ahead to, to chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 17 and 18. Then Daniel went into his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Get to chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And <laughs> it wants, this is some great stuff. Nebuchadnezzar wants to know the interpretation of the dream. At one point he has a dream. He doesn't remember the dream and he doesn't know what it means. And he tells his wise men, all right, tell me the dream and the interpretation. He thought, listen, you thought your boss was tough. Their, their boss says, you tell me the dream I had and the interpretation of it. Well, when it comes to interpreting dreams, Daniel didn't want to die with those who couldn't do it. Instead, you know what he did? He prayed. He prayed about it. And he got some other men who he knew were godly men. 
he got them to pray with him. These men prayed together, and these men stood together. Young folks, if you're going to live your life for Jesus Christ, you better find some friends that are good, godly Christians who love the Lord. Because we live in a world that is ever increasingly hostile to the beliefs of the Bible. And if you're going to live those out loud, you better find some Christian friends. That's not just true of young people, is it? Folks, that's true of all of us. If you're going to live your life for Jesus, you better find some friends that you can rest on and depend on. There better be people in your life that you know love Jesus and will be there when the chips are down. Here, here's one of the great things that we found through Awake 21. Every night at Awake 21 in January when we met together and had that series of, of worship services, every night somebody from the Faith and Family Coalition, usually Judge Dugan, but that's, every night somebody would get up and say, we stand for the... We stand for the sanctity of human life, especially the life of the unborn. Here are people that are willing to stand against abortion. People don't like it if you stand against abortion sometimes. But our church will. And the pastor will. I can tell you that. And the good news is there are a lot of other churches and a lot of other pastors who are willing to stand with us on those issues. They talk about the sanctity of marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman, and that's it. And we're going to stand on that truth, but I'm going to tell you something. We're not alone in standing on those truths. That Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He's the Son of God revealed in the Word of God. That Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, rose from the dead. He'll save anybody who will come to Him. Every night somebody talked about that. And there are a whole lot of churches that are willing to stand with us if the world turns against us. We're not in this alone. Christian, you're not in it alone. Young person, you're not in this alone. There are still 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There are still those who love Jesus Christ. Daniel found those friends. Know who you can depend on. Know who will defend you. And finally, know how to disagree agreeably. Verse 11. Then said Daniel, then said, hold on, i got to pick up my Bible so I can see this here getting old and I can't see it. Then said Daniel to Melzad, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servant, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Daniel said, I, we, we can't eat the king's meat. It's not prepared the way that the Bible says. Just give us vegetables and water. And you try that for ten days. Just, just try it for ten days and you, you see what happens. Now, Daniel stood for what was right, but he wasn't a joker. The easy and natural response for us when we firmly believe what we're standing for is to be belligerent about it, to be a joker. You know what the New Testament says about Jesus? John says this in his gospel. You know what he says about Jesus? He says that Jesus came in grace and truth. Jesus always stood for what was right. Do you know that? But Jesus was always gracious. Sometimes he was harsh. Y'all know the saying, what would Jesus do? They even made like bracelets about it and stuff like that. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, I saw this week on Facebook somebody posted something and it says, whenever people ask you what would Jesus do, remember that making a whip and driving, flipping tables is not out of the realm of possibilities when you talk about what Jesus would do. Well, Jesus did a lot of things, but I'm going to tell you one thing he did. Jesus always lived graciously. Jesus knew how to disagree with people, but not make them hate him. If people reject your message, fine. If they reject you as a person, that's on you. If it's because of the way you say it, the way you come across, because you're just a joke. Young folks, you all are on fire for Jesus. Good. Don't lose that fire. But don't be a joke. Know what defines you, know what defiles you, know who will defend you, and know how to disagree agreeably. Stand for what's right and be gracious. I'm going to ask our instrumentalists to come, and we're going to have a, a hymn of invitation. Listen, maybe you're here today, and you have never done what we've talked about in this message today. Maybe you have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and be the Lord of your life. It's what we call it church, being saved. Maybe you've never done that. You can. Right here, right now, today, you can be saved. 
I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. You can pray this silently where you are, whether you're here watching this service online. If you pray this prayer and you're sincere in this prayer, Jesus will save you. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, will you let me know? Getting saved is not the end. It's just the beginning. And I want to talk to you about how to walk with Jesus and how one day you're going to live with Him in heaven. Will you come let me know if you made that decision? Maybe you're here and you've been saved, but there's some sin in your life. You need to come and repent of that sin leave this place on fire for Jesus Christ maybe you want to join our church maybe you want to be baptized if you've been saved and you want to follow the Lord and be obedient to some baptism or maybe some other decision maybe you just need to be praying at this altar there's a burden on your heart and you need to leave it at this altar in prayer today whatever decision you need to make if God is calling would you step out and come would you stand